Welcome to another episode of the Distributed Data Show brought to you by Datastax Academy, where we bring you the latest news and interview technical experts to help you succeed at building large scale distributed systems. Welcome everyone, Distributed Data Show. I'm live in the studio today. My name is Patrick McFadden. And with me, I have Jeff Carpenter. And live from Denver, I have Luke Tillman. Hello, friends. And always in Florida, he doesn't seem to ever want to leave. That would be David Gilardi. <laughs> hello, hello. I like to point out where you are, just so people know we're so international and remote. It's so cool. <laughs> Florida, Florida and Denver. Is, yeah. No, Florida is international. It is. Sure it international. is international. <laughs> <laughs> we did have an international. Now we're not anymore. So we need to get some people from another country. But Florida is pretty close. Pretty close. Every time I go there, I feel like I'm in a different country. Most people from outside the U.S. don't get that. All right. So um, <laughs> this is uh, today we, we brought we brought us a new guest here, and this is actually pretty exciting because this is something I've been using quite a bit lately. It's about. Um, Data Stack Studio, and we have uh, Bob Brighty on, who's going to tell us a little bit about visualization of graph databases. And it is the hot topic. Let's face it, graph is the cool kid right now, and for good reason. It's got a lot of sizzle to it. But let's get into practice. So, Bob, welcome. Thanks for having me. Are you uh, are you ready for the the round robin of questions? I think I'm ready. All right. Bob, I just want you to know I'm jealous of your beard. It's cool. If you work on it, you can catch up. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no beard shaming on the distributed data show, okay? <laughs> so, Bob, can you tell us a little bit about your background, like where you came from, what, you know, what is your experience, and just let people know who you are? Sure. So, I've been with Datastax for a few years, and I joined the company via acquisition. I was a member of the Aurelius team. That was a crew of seven guys, seven developers. We worked on things like Titan, the open source graph database, and Tinkerpop. And uh, I was a consultant with that team. And then uh, Datastax acquired Aurelius. I joined Datastax. And since then, I've been primarily focused on the Datastax Studio project, which we're going to talk about today, with a uh, specific focus on graph visualization and interaction. All right, so question to you, Bob. What is the core purpose of Studio? I want to hear this. Yeah, so Studio is really at its core. It's, it's a developer enablement tool. And what I mean by that is if you think about the folks that are using Datastax Enterprise, they're writing CQL queries, writing Gremlin traversals, profiling those things for optimization, building applications, maybe doing some, uh, some data management tasks, things of this nature. Studio is our attempt to enable them to make their lives as easy as possible in accomplishing those tasks. Nice. So one of the things that's a little bit different about Studio with respect to some of the tools that we've had in the past, like the CQL shell, which is still a great tool, and uh, the old Dev Center product, uh, Studio is a little different, right? Because it has this this notebook type of format, which is a little bit different might be new for some people. Yeah, you know, notebooks have been around for a long time. They go at least all the way back to the early MATLAB days, maybe even earlier than that, I don't know. And uh, they've definitely started to pick up steam. We're seeing them more and more often now. And when we looked at the different ways that we could deliver this product, different ways to enable development, the notebooks really stood out to us because they just hit such a wide variety of use cases. Like there's just so much cool stuff you can do in a notebook, right? So as a developer, I use the notebook all the time when I'm writing Gremlin, and it's a great way to organize my thoughts in a top-down flow. So I have a notebook. It's a collection of cells. Each cell is its own little idea or traversal, and it makes it really easy for me to work through those things, save my thoughts. I can come back to that later, revisit what I was working on, see the results, all that sort of stuff. But it's also really useful for folks who are doing presentations, maybe building tutorials for others to consume. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely, when we took a step back and looked at all the things that it enabled, we thought, well, hey, this is a no-brainer. We're gonna, we're gonna build a notebook. 
Yeah, the notebook the notebook thing is definitely hot. I mean, it's not as hot as get graph databases, but pretty close. And there's been some that are really specific around a language. For instance, uh, Jupyter, which used to be IPython notebook. That was a very Python-centric notebook. Um, and Spark notebook, which is very specific to Spark. But what is it uh, that Studio, what languages does Studio support? Yeah, so for Studio, like I said, we're trying to enable developers who are working with Datastax Enterprise. So the features that we put into Studio are very specific to that. We started with support for Gremlin, and then in 2.0, we released support for CQL. So that's what we have so far. And for each of those, we have a really best-in-class, top-of-the-line editor experience. Uh, you're not going to find better CQL or Gremlin editing capabilities anywhere else right now. And I'm not, I'm not at all shy about saying that. It, it is the best out there right now. Along with that, we have really nice interactive schema visualization capabilities. So when you're writing your traversals, writing your CQL queries, you can have your schema right there on the side of the screen, always reminding you what's going on. And uh, in addition to that, we have profiling capabilities for each of those languages. So when we put out support for a language, we really go for it. You know, we got the smart editor, we got the schema visualization, and we've got profiling. Now I'm not a uh, no, I'm not a manager uh, or an executive here, but I like pretty charts and graphs just as much <laughs> as the next manager. Seriously, ask Patrick. No, the manager it's true. It's true. loves yeah. pretty charts and graphs. He loves them. So, what kind of uh, like if you want, if I want to do visualization inside a studio, what kind of data views do we have? We actually have a pretty broad range of data visualization capabilities. You know, you you'll never not never. You won't hear me right now say that Studio is a BI tool. Studio is not a is not a BI tool. It's it's not a full fledged data analysis tool. But to enable the tasks that I was talking about, things like data management, things like developing traversals and queries, you do need some visualization tools. So we have pretty good range of those things, starting from your very basic things like just a raw JSON view. We have a table view, you know, pretty straightforward rows and columns type of thing. But then things start to get a little bit more exciting. We have uh, pie charts, bar chart, charts, line charts, line area, and scattergram. So pretty good range of you know your uh, pervasive charting capabilities there, as well as we have the graph view for visualizing your uh, DSC graph data. And then we also have the profile views for optimizing SQL and Gremlin queries, like I mentioned before. And then lastly, although it's not technically a data view, we also have the schema viewers that I talked about before to provide you a way to interactively examine your schema. All right, so just same, shameless plug here real quick. Um, you know, given the stuff you were talking about with like the charting and some of the ways you can visualize things and cells and that kind of deal, uh, we have actually a whole set of videos uh, in uh, Data Sex Academy right now that actually go through all those, uh, uh, all the various capabilities. Matter of fact, I kind of stole some of your information, Bob, <laughs> from the past to do that. Um, but anyway, that's my shameless plug. Go, go take a look. If you do a search for uh, Studio and Graph, you'll, you'll definitely find them in Datasex Academy. Yeah, definitely check that stuff out. There's, uh, there's a lot of good material there, and I don't, I don't mind the shameless plug at all. Happy to have folks checking that stuff out. <laughs> so this is the point where all of our listeners are going to pause the show and go to Datasex Academy and watch that content, and then they're going to come <laughs> back. But for those that don't do that, how about we give them a demo live here on distributed data show can we do that let's do it let's check studio Tricky. out live live demo gods let's do this so what we're taking a look at here is uh data stack studio notebook and you can see a bunch of these individuals in kind of like an org chart layout and this represents the really talented and fantastic studio development qa and documentation team over here on the left hand side this Clump of individuals represents the development team, and you can see that we all report to Shannon, who is the PM. Over here, we have the QA folks who report to Rick, and then over here is Jim, who does documentation. So let's imagine that we want to maybe look at, like, who's been around the longest in terms of how long they've worked at Datastax, and I pre-populated some of that data, so I'm just going to show off some of the graph visualization customization capabilities. I'm going to say I want to size each vertex by how long they've been here. And that's kind of cool, but I want to get another dimension working so that my eyeballs can do a little bit more work. And I'm going to say that I also want to color each of the vertices by that value. Hmm. And this is a good time to point out that this chart, you know, it doesn't look great, right? Because I don't care that each person has a different number of days that they worked here. 
That's not, it's not a categorical value. Studio doesn't understand that because it's a domain agnostic tool. It doesn't know what data stacks means, but it does provide you the capability to come in here and configure it the way you want. So I'm going to say I want to use a linear scale, and now this is looking pretty good, right? I can see that the individuals that have been here the longest, their vertices appear both larger and hotter in terms of the temperature of the color. So it's a really good way to examine the structure of the network while also getting a rough understanding of some of the relative values in the data. Visual now let's say, is that what you're exactly. saying? Exactly. Yeah, these yeah, are, yeah. So you can get like a, so for those of you who are not watching and listening, I mean, this, this is very obvious to someone who's just taking a glance of the picture that there is a big difference between each one of these vertexes. Yeah, and for some of them, it can get a little hard to tell, right? Like if you look over here on the side, you can see that Bob, that's me, Zach and John, we all joined right around the same time. So we have a very, very similar color and diameter on our vertex. So this is when uh, Studio's multi data visualization capabilities really shine because I can jump down here into the next cell and I can say, I wanna look at uh, specifically the days at data stacks. I want to order by that, and then I can create a bar chart. So I'm going to come here for the bar chart. I'm going to say I want my x-axis to be the name of the individual mm -hmm. and my y-axis to be how long they've worked here, and voila, Studio automatically creates this really nice-looking chart, and I barely had to do any work to make it happen. And just to reiterate, none of this was pre-configured. The work that you would do if you were starting from scratch, I did it all right there. So Studio doesn't know anything about you know, person vertexes or days at data stacks or anything like that. It's doing this all on the fly, which is pretty exciting. One of the other visualizations I want to quickly show off is the Gremlin profile view. It's a little bit of an underrated feature. It's one of those things where you don't realize how badly you need it until you really need it. So what this is showing us is a, a collection of traversal steps and the x-axis represents how much time was taken to execute that step. And you'll notice right away it's jumping out and it's showing me this red exclamation part. And what exclamation point, excuse me, what that means is that we're, we're not utilizing an index for this traversal. That's a big red flag. You would never want to do that in a production environment because your performance would just tank. It would be turtles all the way. So Studio provides a lot of insight into profiling this sort of thing. This view is really useful when you start optimizing your Gremlin traversals. And uh, it's just a, a really exciting tool to have out there because this sort of capability doesn't exist anywhere else. So this is in a graphical explain plan, basically. Uh, no, actually, it, it's not. There's, there is also an explain step, which is oh, interesting. exactly. Okay, so there's more. Refer, <laughs> there is more. So you can do an explain. We'll take a look at that here. This shows you. This shows you the the query plan. What's oh, interesting okay. about the profile view is that because of the dynamic nature of the DSE graph executor, this actually analyzes the traversal in real time. Because depending on the cardinality of your data, it may choose to utilize different indexes at runtime. Mm. So the explain step actually is incapable of providing all the information that you might be looking for. That's why you execute the traversal and profile it. Then you get to see exactly what actually happened under the hood. Hmm. Wow, that's really cool. Cool. Yeah. So Bob. So um, you know, I know we're primarily talking about Gremlin right, right now, uh, but for the stuff you just showed, like the profiler and the charts and that kind of deal, does it does that also work with CQL? Yeah, you know, one of our kind of core tenets in the studio is that we want to be as consistent as possible across the features that we provide. You know, that's that's just good UX. It should it should be consistent to the extent possible. So for for the charting capabilities and the profiling, that stuff is very, very similar between CQL and Gremlin, especially like the charting stuff. Uh, it, it's it's almost identical. So someone who learns cool. one easily be able to do the other. Oh, very cool. OK. All right, so um, how about what I'm curious about this. What do you think is the most underrated future in studio that you wish more folks kind of knew about? Yeah, that's a tough call because uh, like a proud parent, um, a lot of the features are my favorite. But in terms of which ones are underrated, you know, there's definitely some that I feel are just super useful and, and valuable that Really, I wish more folks knew about them because they are kind of hidden. And uh, I, I think the profiler is a big one, but also um, if 
I had to pick the most underrated feature, it would probably be a schema aware content assist. Whoa, okay, hold on. Schema aware content assist. That's a really fancy word for type ahead. Am I right? Uh, no, not quite, Patrick. It's actually it's actually even better than that. So it's, let's take a look. And yeah, I want to see example. this. So yeah, I'm I'm trying to visualize this, and I don't think that we can explain it as well as you're going to be able to show it. So show us what you got. Yeah, Patrick. Let's just take a look at it. I think it'll be a little easier to explain if we just kind of yeah. go through it. I think this is a visual thing for sure. Yeah. So what we have here is just a, a really kind of silly little example that represents a household. And take a look at the schema. You see that we have a person. A person can own things like motorcycles and houses and cars. And houses can have addresses. And a person can also have a pet. So let's imagine that I want to write a traversal using uh, this, this graph. I'm going to say that I want to grab uh, a dog. So now I'm sitting on the a, a vertex that represents a dog, and I want to look at maybe the incoming edges. So when I'm sitting here, I'm going to hit control space, and this is going to trigger content assist. And what you'll notice is that I only have, is my top recommendation, a single edge label has pet. Mm -hmm. So if we go over and we look at the schema, what you can see is that Studio was smart enough to not recommend owns edges. It didn't recommend has address edges because it understands that those aren't reasonable choices based on the schema when you're sitting on a dog vertex. So it's examining the traversal as you write it to figure out kind of where you are in your steps. And it's also in near real time going out to DSC graph to fetch the schema so that it can make these kind of smart suggestions. To highlight that a little bit more, I'll just show a slightly different example. Let's say we start with a person and we take a look at the adjacent edges. You can see that a person can have a pet and a person can also own things. The has address edge label, on the other hand, is not recommended because it just doesn't make sense in terms of this schema. Now, this might seem a little bit contrived, and it certainly is, but when you start to get you know, real-world scenario type schemas that are more complex, this stuff becomes hugely valuable, especially when you start getting deeper and deeper in your traversal. It's very easy to start to lose track and, oh, what did I name that thing? And you're looking stuff up somewhere else, it's kind of distracting you from your flow. Not in studio. You're, you're right here authoring your traversal, getting smart content assist, and you don't have to worry about going anywhere else to find all that information. That is really cool. Yeah, I mean, that is absolutely true. I think in when I was trying to come up to speed on Gremlin, that is the number one problem is where am I? in this traversal what can, what kind of nodes or edges am i on you can get lost really quick in a big graph yeah <laughs> so bob you're a you're a busy man and you work on a busy team what um you know kind of can you give us hints maybe on what it is you guys are are working on or something that we can look forward to in a future version so you know folks might kind of be aware of this but like as a developer one of the things that i'm trained to do is Ne never commit to anything. Never give any public dates or anything like that. So it's a little bit of a uh, little bit of uh, you know kind of crazy waters here. But um, you know, I got, I got permission to give you guys a couple hints. A little, a little, a little, a couple spoilers. So a taste will do you. That'll help. Yeah, a little, a little taste. That's right. So some of the things that we're really excited about that are coming up. The first one, possibly the most heavily requested studio feature to date, is notebook import export. Yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. The ability to be happy about that. You can right. just stop. <laughs> yeah. All right, the, the, no more. That's good. You yeah, had me at import. <laughs> you had so, me at import. <laughs> yeah, and what's fun about this feature is that it it solves a different use case for every different persona. So if you're a person who does presentations and tutorials, maybe like a Patrick or a David or Jeff, you know, you guys that are doing these evangelist tasks, you'll be able to write studio notebooks, throw them out on the web. Folks will be able to download them, upload them into their studio instance, and consume that information. So that's huge. Similarly, if you're a documentation person, you can write documentation examples to share with folks in the same way. But at the same time, if you're one of our customers, you're a developer working on with against DSC, maybe you run into some bugs sometimes. You can use Studio to create a reproduction of that that you can send off to support so that you don't have to worry about like awkward code snippets or environment setup or anything like that. It'll make it really easy for them to replicate what you're doing because they just upload their notebook and it should behave the same way. And then lastly, you know, just inner team communication. So as a developer working on a project, 
you figured out this traversal, you finally nailed it, you want to share it with your coworkers, you can just create a studio export, they can upload it into their instance and try it out. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a really exciting feature, hits a lot of different use cases. Some of the other stuff that we're pretty excited about that we're working on right now is support for DSC analytics. So as I mentioned, you know, we really want to be the mm. Datastax enterprise development tool. And to do that, we have to, we have to incorporate more of the capabilities and analytics is next on our list. And then some of the other, um, other things that we're looking at are like notebook versioning. So for example, I'm, I'm guilty of this all the time. I think, oh, I could maybe make this even better, but then I screw it up, right? And I want to get back to that spot where it was working correctly. Right now, we have some like browser based on do capabilities, but it's really not great. So we're going to add versioning to make it so that you get like, you know, well defined milestones that you can go back to. That'll be really useful for development. And then the last, the last big thing that's coming up is graph interactions. So we kind of saw how it's pretty easy to execute a gremlin traversal that produces either a graph or a Caesar edges and studio can display those things very easily. It's automatic, but where things get tricky is, you know, maybe you just want to see a little bit more of that you want to dive in and explore in an interactive fashion. Right now you can't do that, but we're working on it. So that'll enable you to uh, yeah, just kind of find a starting point and then you can say, oh, let me see what edges are off of this vertex and this one and this one, dive in and out and move around. And it'll also make the product a lot more approachable to folks that aren't fully up to speed yet on Gremlin. Gremlin does have a little bit of a learning curve. so. The interactive graph will be a way to ease in to examining your DSC graph data. Wow, that's really cool. Excellent. So we're super excited about Studio. I think we're all big fans of it here. And we really want to thank you, Bob, for coming on the show and talking with us today. We look forward to maybe having you on some future episodes. Cool. Thanks for having me. And just a, a quick message to the listeners out there, the Studio users. Please don't be shy about reaching out to us if there's features that you're looking for, bugs that you run into, things you're confused about. You know, we're all like really, really passionate about this project. The development team, everyone that works on it, we're, we're really into it. We'd love to hear from you. So please don't be shy. Feel free to reach out. At Datastax Academy Slack it has a channel dedicated to studio. Please show up and be heard. Thank you for joining us again for the Distributed Data Show. We love your feedback, so go to the Distributed Data Show page on Datastax Academy and tell us what you think. You can also find us on the Datastax Academy YouTube channel or find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get great podcasts. While you're there, make sure and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode.